Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 97 of the Box Hard Podcast. It's again the usual suspects. I'm here with my panel member, slash co host, slash co founder, all the rest, Mr. Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how are you doing? I'm good, Joey. How are you? Very good, my friend. Very good. Now, this show is another edition of the American August. I think we're going to call this the last few shows the American August because last August. You know, there wasn't too many fights on. We didn't know what to do. We were scratching our heads a little bit. We brought in like a world champion every single show. And this month of August, without even realizing it, I've been looking and we've spoke to like Americans, 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 Americans every week. So this episode will have another two Americans on it. Last week's one had two Americans on it. The week before that, I think we had two Americans on it. So it seems like we're just doing an American August. There's nothing wrong with that. It is what it is. That's the theme this month. Um... However, August hasn't been fight-free. There has been quite a few fights going on. Um, We're going to start the show with the review part of the show, where, again, we review the action last week. We give our thoughts on what went down in the boxing rings around the world from last week. Um, Then we're going to bring in guest number one, a man that is in a seriously good position. He's going to be fighting for a world title very soon, and he gets his chance to become the youngest super middleweight world champion in history. So we'll be speaking to that man after the review part. And then when we come back in part two, we're going to be uh, talking about the the latest news. There's a couple of bits of of, of news to go over. And then we're also going to give... It's not really a pound-for-pound list, but we're going to basically... Me and I are going to discuss who the number one man is in each division. From heavyweight all the way down to, I don't know, probably flyweight or something like that. As the weights go lower and lower, (laughs) the knowledge goes a little bit thinner and thinner for those really low weights. So probably from about heavyweight down to flyweight, we're going to basically give our opinion on who the number one man is at those weights and the reason behind them being the number one. So that should be pretty interesting. That should be pretty fun. Um, Before we go on, I just want to also give a couple of shout outs to our regular listeners. I want to give a shout out to Danny Biggs. I want to give a shout out to Ricey, who's... um, could even be on an aeroplane right now going over to the Falklands. He's going away for six months. He's an avid listener of the Box Hard podcast, and uh, he, he assures me that he's going to be listening to every week's show. So all the very best to you, pal. Thank you once again. And um, I'm also going to give a shout-out to Valley Legend as well, uh, uh, You know, uh, another great listener of this podcast. So thank you very much to all those guys there. Let's get on with the show. We're going to start with the review part. As I said, we're going to visit a fight from last week at the Printham Park, which is, um, I think, the Tranmere Rovers FC uh, ground or something to do with, with, with that football club. Over in Birkenhead, Merseyside, United Kingdom. One fight to mention on this bill, Sean Masher Dodd, 13-2 and two with one draw, took on journeyman Antonio Horvatic. This was Antonio Horvatic's 50th pro fight and unfortunately for him he got another loss so his record 10 wins and 40 losses now Sean Dodd decided to have this little kind of keep busy slash warm up kind of fight before he takes on Tom Stalker on September 30th so um, yeah good idea I suppose you know, for him to get out once again before that fight. Sean Dodd now 14-2 and two with one draw. I'm actually looking really forward to that fight with Tom Stalker. Horvatic was given a standing count in the second round, and he was down three times in that third round, where ultimately he was TKO'd. So a good win there for Sean Dodd. Moving over now to the Pinnacle Bank Arena, where all the action really happened over in Lincoln, Nebraska, USA. We're going to start with the undercard. Mike Alvarado, 37 and four took on Sydney Sequeira 26 and 12. I haven't seen the fight, but I saw the finish. Mike Alvarado picked up a humongous knockout in round four. It was scheduled for eight, and he looked pretty good doing it. So Mike Malhai Alvarado now 38 and four. Sydney Sequeira, we knew that he was 
overmatched a little bit, but we weren't too sure, and we never quite are too sure um, which Mike Alvarado is going to turn up come fight night. He gets up to all sorts of things outside the ring, unfortunately. But um, yeah, uh, you know, a good win for him. That's uh, that's good to see. Also on that bill, Shakur Stevenson, the young, uh, the young prospect, being managed and guided by Andre Ward. He moved to three and zero with a unanimous decision win over six rounds against David Mitchell Paz, who had a winning record of four and three. It's now been levelled out. It's four and four. He's got one draw as well. Shakur Stevenson, pretty much won every round. Um, a little bit amateur I suppose you could say. You know, he kind of um, throws a lot of shots, doesn't really load up too much. Um, I don't want to be overcritical because I think he's a tremendous fighter. He's still, he's still only three fights into his pro career, so, you know, we've got to be patient with him. But, no, phenomenal, phenomenal young fighter. Also on the bill, Bryant Jennings. I was happy to see him pick up win number 20. He was on the show a few weeks back. He had his opponent down, Daniel Martz. He had him down three times in round two, where he ultimately won the fight by TKO in that second round. So all the very best there to Bryant Jennings, 20-2 and two now, and Daniel Martz, 15-5 and five with one draw. Dillian White's fight. Now, this one was shown on the Sky Telecast as well. Um, well, you know, it wasn't shown live. We saw, like, a replay of it, I suppose, um, all three rounds. Huh, it was it was it was a bit it was a bit wild. It was a bit it was a bit strange. Malcolm Tan, we obviously said on last week's show, he's only had three fights in the last ten years. This was his fourth fight in ten years. Malcolm Tan was down twice in the second round. Now, when he went down, both times, especially the first time, he waited till the referee basically said ten, and he got up, or he got up about nine and three quarters, something like that. And as soon as the, you know, as soon as he rise to his feet, the referee said ten. Do you want to continue? And he kind of sort of motioned like he did, but you know his body language wasn't really kind of agreeing with his shaking of the head or his muttering of the words. And his corner man actually come up, you know, on the uh, on the canvas with. You know, like ready to take out his gum shield or whatever, like the fight was over, and um, he decided to. I don't, I don't know. It was a bit messy, and then he kind of went back to his corner, but then kind of carried on. It was just weird, and then he gets knocked down again, probably about twenty or thirty seconds after that. Um, Dillian White was really, you know, kind of like winging him with those body shots as well, and he had him down for the second time in that round, um, and again he did the exact same thing. He got up at about nine and a half. And the referee, you know, gave him a chance to carry on once again. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Dillian White hit him with a punch that he was a bit annoyed about. And all of a sudden, he kind of woke up and wanted to continue. And he looked okay for the closing of that round two. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I can't really remember too vividly now. Um, it was a bit of a joke, really. And then when he came out in round three, he got stopped properly by Dillian White. So Dillian White did what he had to do. Again, I'm not quite sure why the whole fight even happened. It wasn't like a... You know, a great win. We know, you know, we know as proper boxing fans that Mike, Malcolm Tan never really had anything to offer. And, you know, Dillian White didn't really fight in front of hardly any people. If you actually see, there was hardly anyone in the in the seats around the the arena. So I'm not quite sure what that was all about. But, you know, he gets a win on the road. It's, it's been a long time since he's done that. So, um yeah, I'm, I'm pleased for Dillian White now, 21 and 1. Malcolm Tan at 24 and 6. Also on that bill, the um, the fight that opened up the card on Sky, which was um, the first live live bout. 22 and 0. Mike Reed. He's been on the show before. He took on Robert Frankel, 35 and 17 with one draw. Mike Reed. Um, you know, I like the guy and all that, but it was a little bit boring, that fight for me. I feel like it dragged, it went the full distance, 10 rounds. Mike Reed won unanimously. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think he actually shut the guy out. So, you know, that's a good win, I suppose. But doesn't really possess the firepower, didn't really take too many risks. And, you know, I can't, bla you know, we're not the ones in there, you know taking the punches and I, I understand the whole game you know why put it all on the line for the fans you know I've got to think about myself kind of angle I understand that and I respect that but 
you know, he, he kind of just didn't really step up the gear at all. He, he just fought at one pace and, you know, it was he just cruised really. So not not overly impressive, but again, a, another win. That's all that matters. His record now 23-0. and Mike Reed and Robert Frankel 35-18 and now with one draw. Also on that bill, Alexander Kavodzdik. Everybody was quite high on him before the fight, but some people were saying that he wasn't very impressive. I thought he did quite well in my honest opinion. Um, He retained his NABF light heavyweight title and also the WBO NABO light heavyweight title. His opponent, Craig Baker, the American, was 17-1, and his record going in. Um, He was down once in round six where it was stopped. It was uh, TKO in round six for Gavodstik. And, you know, maybe he didn't perform all that well, but he still pretty much won every round. I think that Craig Baker had a good jab when he got going. The thing what kind of struck me and kind of surprised me a bit was Craig Baker came straight out, sent a ring in that first round. He seemed very, very confident. And, um, you know, his belief kind of got him through a few of those rounds where I think that Gavozdik started a bit slow, you know, but eventually, you know, he caught up with him and stopped him like he does pretty much all of his opponents. And now the main event, let's talk about this one, Ayers. I know that you tuned in for this. The undercard wasn't all that great, but the main event... Terence Crawford 31 and 0 took on Julius Indongo 22 and 0. Obviously, we all know all four belts were on the line for this. It was a double unification, if you like. Both men had two belts each: the IBF and WBA super belt with Julius Indongo, and of course the WBC and WBO belts with Terence Crawford. Um, going into the fight. You said on last week's show, Ayers, that you thought that Crawford would win on points. I didn't actually give a prediction, but I thought that he was going to probably win on points as well. I think he would have done really well to stop Indongo. Um, We were both wrong. He managed to stop him and not only stop him, you know, over the course of a hard fight. Everything went Crawford's way and he stopped him very early. What was your thoughts about that? A really impressive win from Crawford there for me. Definitely, I can tell you that for a fact. Really, really impressive win by Terence Crawford. Last, as I said last week in the show, I thought Crawford, I thought this fight was going to go to points. In the first round, you can see Ndongo like going wild, but Crawford was as usual like boxing him. In the second round, Ndongo was going for wild punches, and Crawford dropped him in the second round. Now in the third round. Crawford hit him with a body shot which hurt uh, Ndongo and knocked him out. In my opinion, right, now he's he's the unified division. He's won the title. In my opinion, now, I think it's time for him to go up to 147 and fight the winner, Jeff Moore versus Manny Pacquiao. That would be a very good fight for him. Yeah, um, you know, we're, we're not quite sure if, if that rematch is going to be coming off. I've heard all sorts of rumours about the Manny Pacquiao, Jeff Horn thing. But back to the Crawford um, in Dongo fight there. Obviously, you know, we thought that he was going to go to points because Crawford, even though he stopped, you know, he stopped many people, I don't really have him down as like a one punch kind of knockout artist. He's like, you know, he knocks people out with accumulative punches. Um, also, we, we, you know, we're looking at Ndongo's record. Not, it's not filled with with many names, but he's been in there with a couple guys. He's done well. He doesn't seem to really tire over the stretch. He hasn't shown any vulnerabilities from what we'd seen. And um, I was, you know, I was, I was startled by the fact that Crawford was able to solve the Ndongo puzzle so quickly. Um, you know, again, I want to give big credit to Crawford's training team and, and Crawford himself, obviously. Um, you know, last week we had Jamel Herring on the show. He was talking a little bit to me about the, you know, being in camp with Crawford and all the rest of that. But no, you know, Ndongo, as you said, he was down in round two and that finish in round three was absolutely devastating. I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was a left, like a, like a kind of left hook to the, to the, well, to the, to the body, but right, it wasn't like on, you know, I wouldn't say it was a hook, so, so to speak, because it wasn't really around the side, it was it was kind of straight down the middle, right kind of on his belly button, caught him like on that kind of, uh, right on the on the belt line kind of thing, you know, in, in the sweet spot, if you like, and, you know, it's, it's a soft area, and he wasn't expecting the punch to come, and he caught him properly with it, and it was just one of those, um, one of those punches, you just know that was it, you know, you could, he just couldn't get up from that, but... In in Dongo's, you know, in his defence, I will say that he did not fight with the right game plan. But I'd also say 
I don't really know what the right game plan is to beat Crawford. He looks that special at the moment. And as we t- touched on as well, um, you know, he becomes a unified champion. We haven't seen many of those over the years in boxing. It's been a long time. Uh, Bernard Hopkins, the last person to properly unify and own um, all the belts, all the proper recognized top belts at once. And Terence Crawford does that here. It's a bit of a shame that the IBF are already trying to... Um, Force a mandatory upon him, and he's only been, you know, he's only been the IBF champion for, well, for for like five days. So, you know, that, that's a bit of a shame. We're not quite sure if his future even lies at 140. He may move up to 147. I'd like to see the fight you mentioned as well, and many others. I'd like to see him against Errol Spence. That really gets my, uh, uh, you know, my my mouth watering. That's that's a brilliant, brilliant fight down the line. Um. Yeah, that's it for Nebraska. Moving over now to a fight card that happened earlier this week. It took place on Tuesday at the Sam's Town Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, USA, of course. And the promoter of this bill was Floyd Money Mayweather. Now, he wasn't in attendance, as far as I know, but someone that was in attendance was Iron Mike Tyson. He was there, um, you know, he, he was sitting there in the venue. Um, there was a few fights to mention on the bill. I'm going to start with um, Jamel Herring, friend of the show, of course. I guess it was on last week's show. Again, he's just come out of the camp with Terence Crawford. Uh, Jamel Herring, 16-1, and one, going in against Floyd Mayweather's fighter, Ladarius Miller, 13-1. and one. Now, Jamel Herring, we all know he's fought at the higher level than Miller has, and this was Miller's real, you know, kind of first proper step up, first proper fight. Um... No one can really argue with that, but Jamel Herring unfortunately lost a unanimous decision over 10 rounds. Um, you know, it, it was hard to see this because I really like Jamel Herring. He's a, he's a really, really nice guy. And, you know, in boxing, there's many nice guys, but he truly is one of the, you know, he's the best of the best guys that I've ever spoken to anyway. So, um, Jamel Herring. Yeah, I'm not too sure where he goes from here. Last week, he was telling me that he wants the winner of Flanagan and Vadejo. You know, that's not going to be happening now. Not at all. I don't know if he needs to move up in weight. I don't know if he needs to move down in weight. I don't know if he needs to um, possibly look at perhaps changing his trainer. Somebody mentioned to me on Twitter, perhaps he should do that. I'm not too sure. But something needs to change. Um, I don't know if he overlooked the guy a little bit. You know, kind of iron up the guys at world level. But... This is a huge setback. I'm not too sure where he goes from here. Um, you know, he definitely needs to rebuild. He's got Al Heyman in his corner, which is always a good thing. But, you know, I just I just can't see him becoming a world champion off the back of that performance, unfortunately. I spoke to him just briefly after the fight. Um, we, were, we were texting a little bit on, on the iPhone. And he said to me that he felt he won the fight 6-4 over 10 rounds. And I said to him, but Jamel... You can't go on, a, you know, as an away fighter on 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 a on a home fighter's card, you know, a Floyd Mayweather card at that, and win a fight six four and expect to get the decision. That's too close. And I think he agreed with that. I think he knew that. And you know, unfortunately, he lost the fight. Some people saying a robbery. I'm not quite sure that was the case. But um, yeah, very upset him for for Jamel Herring and. Um, you know, his fans as well, very upset by that, including myself. Also on that bill, Shoki Sakai, 22-7 and seven with one draw. I didn't know a single thing about him apart from he was from Japan going into this fight. He was in an eight-rounder against Ashley Fiafane, our very own member of the money team. And, well, it was another huge, huge upset. Ashley Fiafane lost unanimously over eight rounds. I'm not quite sure why it was even an eight-round fight. I wouldn't have imagined that would have suited Fiafane too much. I think the longer that fight would have gone, it would have probably suited him the better. Um, that's a real tough loss for him as well. That was, I think, his tenth fight maybe with with Floyd Mayweather or something like that. His record now 40 and eight with one draw. And Shocky Sakai certainly come and shocked um, Las Vegas there. Um, you know, also, you know, that, that's a bad, a bad little bit of luck there for Floyd um, in, in this in this huge week for Floyd. That's a bit of bad luck for him. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm very gutted there for, for fear fame, really. You know, he's, he's, he's a class guy, man. I've seen a lot of people giving him stick on Twitter today. It's, 
yeah, I think it's a bit it's a bit out of order, really. Um, he's a really down to earth guy, Ashley Fiafain. So you know, we wish him all the very best. Hopefully, he can come back a little bit stronger from that. Also on that bill, Juan Carlos Payano, former world champion. His record eighteen and one going in. He took on Alexis Santiago, who was twenty one and four with one draw. Um, Payano actually got cut on his left eyebrow during the fight. It wasn't the worst cut in the world. The fight managed to go all 10 rounds. It was a unanimous decision for the former world champion. Juan Carlos Payano now 19 wins inside of 20 fights. He's, of course, carrying one loss as well. Right, that's it for the reviewing. We've done all the reviewing there. It's now time to welcome a man who is set to make history in a few weeks' time. We're now going to welcome guest number one. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the super talented and extremely exciting unbeaten super middleweight contender, Mr. David Benavides. David, welcome to the show. Hey, what's up, brother? How you doing? All good, my friend. All good. Yourself? Yeah, I'm doing very good. I just finished training, actually, so, you know, I feel really good right now. Excellent, man. Excellent. So, firstly, David, you're a really young guy, obviously. You're only 20 years of age, which is just remarkable, really. I want to ask you, how old were you when you first put on a pair of gloves, David? I was actually maybe two. And, you know, I really, like, started seriously training when I was three years old. You know, because I have an older brother. He's 26 years old. And, you know, obviously a little little kid always wants to be like the big brother. So everything he did, I would do. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And obviously, you know, you had a short-lived amateur career. You only had 15 fights, but you won all of them. And um, and now, as a pro, you're 18-0 and with 17 knockouts, as we all know. So you haven't lost a fight, amateur or pro. That must feel pretty good. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a really good feeling, you know, because maybe uh, it says that everything we've done in the gym up to this point has been right. You know, but I don't rely on anything. I just work on – I work – extremely hard every day in the gym i try to better myself you know i watch a tape of boxing i try to like figure out new moves every day and you know i'm um, i'm only getting better with age you know and i feel like you know my time is now so obviously your next fight has just been announced you're going to be taking on ronald gavril for the vacant wbc world super middleweight title now we know that ronald is obviously promoted by floyd mayweather um you know, he's, he's he's trained by a very good trainer as well. And unlike yourself, he's got a very extensive amateur career. Um, obviously, as we said, you only won... Well, you had 15 fights, you won 15. Funny enough, he actually lost 15 fights. But we can't forget, he also won 165 fights as well as an amateur. Another thing that makes this fight very exciting is that you can both certainly punch. What do you know about Ronald yourself, apart from all that stuff? You know, I've been, I've been watching his... I've been watching them for a while. You know, I watch everybody at the super middleweight division. So when they gave me this fight, you know, I, I knew it was going to be a really good fight. And those are the types of fights I want. I don't want the easy fights. You know what I mean? I want the hard fights that are going to push me to become a better fighter myself. You know, but I've been watching Gravel uh, lately. He has, you know, he has good speed. He has good power. Um, he looks like he comes forward a lot. I, mean, I don't know if he's, uh, he's able to box and use the ring, but you know, whatever. Whatever style he wants to bring um, September 8th, I'm going to be ready for it. You know, I'm working with guys right now in the gym, sparring that are, you know, brawlers, other dudes that are boxers. You know, so we're, we're mixing in a little bit. You know, we're going to be ready for anything. And, of course, this is also your chance to become the youngest super middleweight world champion in history. Um, do you know who the youngest super middleweight champion in history at the moment is, by the way? Um, I, I forgot his name, but he was 22 oh, years of age. That's right, that's right, yeah. It was a man called Darren Van Horn. Uh, he, won, yeah, yeah. he won the world title when he was 22 years and 8 months old. If you manage to do this, you're going to be 20 years and, and 8 months old. So basically two whole years quicker than the current quickest guy. And two years, as we all know, is a huge space of time in boxing. Boxing careers don't last too long. How excited are you to be able to break a record like that? That's phenomenal. You know, I'm very excited, you know, to be even to only be able to have a chance of fighting for the WBC title. And not only that, you know, being able to uh, to, to make history in, in the, while doing that as well. You know, it's very exciting. You know, I'm very honored to be in this position. I've been looking forward to this my whole life. And, you know, I've trained basically everything that I've done and I've been through has come up to this moment. You know, I'm, I'm extremely ready and prepared to take that title. 
And I suppose the title of being the youngest ever super middleweight world champion is probably cooler than what I'm about to tell you. But um, there's been less than 75 super middleweight champions in history. So if you win this fight, you're going to be, um, you know, the, the, the youngest to ever do that. But I'm going to tell you something that you probably don't know now. And this took me hours and hours to research this. You will be the 15th youngest WBC world champion of all weight classes. And we all know that the WBC belt is the coolest belt. And there's been over 600 WBC champions across the weight classes in history. So you will be number 15. I think you're, you know, if you win this fight, you're just one month older than Canelo was when he picked up the junior middleweight title. So, you know, you're in there amongst some fantastic names. Yeah, man, to, to, like I said, it's an honor to just be able to be in this position where, you know, nothing's come easy. We worked extremely hard to get to this point. And like I said, man, I can't just, I can't wait to get in there and, you know, just take that title and make history. And I'm just going to explain now to our listeners who may not know how this title shot came about. So you know what I'm about to say here, but just to quickly... Let our listeners know if, if they're a bit confused by the whole thing. Badu Jack was obviously the WBC champion. He vacated the title to move up in weight. So the number one and two ranked guys were supposed to fight. That was Callum Smith and, um, and Anthony Durrell. Obviously, after some messing around with the fight dates and stuff, Callum Smith decided to sign up to the World Boxing Super Series tournament instead. Um, so then Durrell had to you know, to fight the third ranked guy, which was Avni Yildirim, but Yildirim decided to sign up to the tournament as well, and he's going to be taking on Chris Eubank Jr. in the first round, but that's another story. Uh, then Anthony Durrell had to look at fighting the fourth ranked guy, which was the man we're speaking to now, David Benavidez, and however, after that fight was all signed and sealed, Anthony Durrell got injured, so then David had to look at the fifth ranked guy, which was Eubank Jr. Eubank Jr., as we said, was in the tournament, and then it came down to Jesse Hart, a man that was on our show a couple weeks ago but he'd already signed to fight for the WBO world title against Gilberto Ramirez and then next in line ranked at number seven was Patrick Nielsen um, he's the only situation that I'm not aware of but I know that you obviously had to look at number eight which was Ronald Gavril so it's been it's been a pretty crazy situation but you know if a chance comes up in boxing especially career-wise you have to take it and I sh I'm sure that you know that I'm sure that you're you're ready for this it's, it's, a, it's a huge yeah opportunity. And you know actually and before we were talking about the, um, um, you know, before this fight came about, even this opportunity came about, after my fight with Porky Medina, you know, I took a week off. My dad told me, you know what, you have to just get in, you have to get in the gym and work, like if a world title is coming next, because you might never know, you know, somebody could get injured and they could push you up, you know, in the line and fight. And I didn't really think it was going to come about this quick, you know, but I still, you know, training is my number one priority, you know, so I always train very hard. And, you know, we just... Um, and this title shot came about, and it was a little bit, it was a little bit, um, uh, it was a really good thing that happened to me, you know, because it, of course I wanted to fight for a title. And, uh, you know, I, I thought the latest I was in the fight for a title was maybe beginning of the next year. But, you know, it's all like seven months, six months before next year. So, you know, it, 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 it worked out really good for me. Yeah, well done to your father for, for um, you know, anticipating something like that. Now, speaking of those guys I just mentioned that were all in line to fight for the title, a few weeks ago we had Callum Smith on the show, and I asked him about your fight at the time you were going to be fighting Anthony Durrell, and I said, you know, because obviously Callum was supposed to take him on, and he's, you know, he's looked at Durrell very, very closely, and he actually said to me that he believed that you would beat Durrell. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. That was a compliment he paid you. And also, um, a, couple, a couple weeks ago, we spoke to Jesse Hart, as I said. He was on our show. And he said that he wanted to fight you for quite a while. And he said that he believes, in his words, this is, that you were too young to, to, to be in that light. Which I think he kind of meant you were too inexperienced to be a threat to him. Do you have any thoughts on that at all, David? I mean, you know, of the, the course, a dude is showing like a sign of... He's worried a little bit because I'm young and I'm right here and I'm winning these fights and I'm winning them in spectacular fashion. You know, I'm 18 and 0 with 17 knockouts. How much fights did he have? He's done, he hasn't won all of his fights by knockout. He has like what six fights that have that won the distance. So you know, you tell me who has a higher higher percentage of power. You know, if he wants to get in the ring, we could do that too. I mean, we could put up when when if he gets the belt, the WBO belt, and when I win the WBC belt, we could put those titles on the line and we'll see who's the best. 
that certainly would be something that would be interesting. Now, most people in your division, they say that the number one guy out of everybody is James the Gow. A lot of people say that. Now, I know that you've been very close with Gilberto Ramirez. I know that you've sparred him a few times, if I'm not mistaken. Who do you see as the number one man right now at 168? You know, I can't I can't say there's one really top dog in the super mid, the super middleweight division because everybody right now, you know, from Callum Smith to Chris Irving, um, Anthony Terrell, Ramirez to Jesse Hart, you know, they're all really good fighters, you know, so I guess we're just I want to be the best in the division, so I guess we're gonna have to duke it out and see who ends up at the top, see who's the last man standing. Yeah, it's, but it's you know certainly... the division. I think the I think the division is stacked. You know, and it's just an honor to just be in the division with so, all these great, you know, potentially fighters. You know, there's it's gonna be it's gonna be a great year of boxing for the super middleweight division. Not a not a year, but it's gonna be a the upcoming years. The super middleweight division is gonna be great. Yeah, I totally agree. That's a, you're a hundred percent right there. I want to ask you about this fight as well. It's a week after your fight, Triple G Canelo. I know that you've done rounds with Triple G. If I'm not mistaken, I think you've also done some rounds with Canelo. So you should be able to give a, a good opinion on this one. How do you see it playing out? Um, you know, the last well, I was working for Triple G's last camp. I was working with him, and I was supposed to go over to work with Canelo. Um, but when they it was for a week for me to go to Canelo, I don't I think he heard I was working with Triple G and I, I don't know some things got he got in his feelings or something and he just didn't want me to go no more. But I see the fight playing out. You know, it's a really good fight. There's gonna be a knockout. You know, but I got my guy Triple G. You know, he's a, he's a great fighter. He has great power, and I think he sits down on his punches a little bit better than Canelo. But you know, I'm not doubting Canelo at all. Canelo's a great fighter, so. It's going to be whoever wants it more, whoever wants to be the best, whoever truly wants to be the best middleweight, you know, is going to take over. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant fight as well. So many great fights being made in boxing now. And now I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, but I've got a feeling that you're not going to mind too much that I'm going to put you on the spot. I ask everybody this. I like to ask people from overseas who their favorite UK fighter is of all time. But I think I know the answer to that question already without you saying anything. My favorite UK fighter? I think you're going to um, say Prince yep. Nassim Hamed. Yeah. It's Prince. Number one is Prince. Number two is Joe Kawasaki. Okay. Do you want to say anything about those guys? Because Prince is probably the most popular answer we get. Everybody loves him. Um, You know, Prince, you know, growing up, he's one of my favorite fighters. He motivated me a lot. Not only because at the time he, he wasn't, he was, he was a showman. You know, he was the money Mayweather before money Mayweather came about. He was all about business, but he gave, he was a different type of fighter. He would go in and put it all on the line. And his style was way different. He didn't try to be nobody else. He he was himself. You know what I mean? And um, he had awesome power. And you know that to this day, I kind of like, it, it's giving me my style, you know, to try to do different things. Try to work on everything in the gym, not just be, you know, one straight fighter, just have one style. Try to be versatile, you know what I mean? I could box, I could brawl. I could do whatever, you know, and then I'm still learning too. I'm 20 years old, you know, so I still have a lot, uh, a heck of a long way to go. You know, but Prince Nassim is definitely one of uh, my favorite fighters of all time. Yeah, as I say there, most people I ask that question to, they all say Prince. He's, uh, he seems to be loved by everybody. A fantastic fighter, of course. And now coming down to the last couple questions I've got for you, um, or the last, the last real question anyway. Um, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. I wanted to ask you if you have got one. Have you got a prediction for your fight? How do you see yourself winning that fight come September eighth? Um, you know, uh, I'm not I'm not overlooking Gravel because I know he's a great fighter. Like I said. Um, I want to go in there every time I go into a fight. I want to get the people, my fans, you know, the people that are just starting to watch me and the people who are just, you know, uh, going by in my fights. I want to give them a spectacular fight. And for me saying I'm going to win, it means I'm going to get a knockout. That's what I want to do. You know, not only to make a, to win the belt, but I want to win the belt in the state to let everybody know I'm here. Like I did in the Fortune fight. I told everybody I'm going to knock out and nobody would leave me. And that's exactly what I did. So this is exactly what I'm going to do to the belt. I'm going to knock him out. Um... I say I get him out of there in less than six rounds. Less than six rounds. Okay, you said it here. Yeah. And um, also, that Porky win, by the way, was a phenomenal fight. I remember watching that just earlier today. I, I checked the uh, the end of that fight again. Unbelievable combination. And finally, just before we let you go, I want to give you an opportunity to send a message to the UK fans out here, a lot of guys out here, true boxing fans, a lot of guys starting to hear your name and starting to believe in you. What's your message to all those guys? 
you know, I want to give the thanks to everybody in the UK, you know, if everybody who supports me out there, you know, I really appreciate it so much. And one thing else I got to tell you is it's, it's, it's my lifelong dream to fight in the UK. So maybe hopefully, you know, if everything goes good, I keep defending. I win the title and I defend it. Maybe I could fight Colin Smith or Chris Irvings out there. You know, that would be that would be an amazing accomplishment for me. Absolutely. That's something we'd certainly love to see. We'd love to see you over here on British soil. Hopefully that does happen down the line. Um, but yeah, for now, that's it, David. It's been a real pleasure interviewing you this week. Thank you for your time. Best of luck in this uh, September 8th fight. And God willing, next time we speak, I'll be speaking to the new WBC super middleweight champion of the world. All right. Thank you very much, brother. And I, I appreciate uh, your time uh, for interviewing as well. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the preview part. But before we get into that, Laz, I want to go over to you with the latest news. There's only a couple of things I know that we've got to go over. And then, of course, we're going to bring in that little segment where we're going to talk about the number one guys through the wait. So firstly, Laz, the latest news. Carl Frampton has parted ways with Cyclones and Barry, and Barry McGuigan. Yes, um, obviously there were rumours of this happening you know, before it's it's been announced. Um, people weren't quite sure whether to believe it or not. I, for one, didn't really believe it because I felt that the partnership that Frampton has had with the McGuigans, both Barry and Shane, have worked really well for him. Um, it's also come at a bit of a strange time because, you know, he, he had the fight with Santa Cruz, then he had the rematch with Santa Cruz, and not much has happened since then. He, you know, he, he's obviously was supposed to fight the other day, and that fight got called off due to a freak accident. It just seems a really untimely breakup. I just can't quite wrap my head around it. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see where his next steps really are because, you know... I'm not quite sure what's happening trainer-wise. I don't know if... Has it, has it come out that he's actually leaving Shane McGuigan, or is it just the whole thing with Barry and being his well, promoter and all the rest of that? On Shane McGuigan's tour, he used to have Frampton, but he doesn't have Frampton anymore. Oh, that's it then. That says it all. So, yeah. I'm not quite sure where he's going to go, um, you know, uh, promoter-wise. I know, obviously, he's, he's, he's inked some kind of deal with Al Heyman that's been going on for a while. Um He's going to need to obviously be with a big promoter, not only because he's a big enough name in world boxing, but also because he needs a TV network. So does he go back to Eddie Hearn? I don't think so, because they can't... Well, I was going to say they can't stand each other. I think Eddie Hearn doesn't mind him. I don't think he can, I don't think he can stand Eddie Hearn. Um, will he go stateside and look at perhaps Bob Arum with the likes of you know Michael Conlon coming through? Will he go with Frank Warren? Will he go with MGM? You know, there's obviously friends of his like um, Paddy Barnes and all these guys uh, that have just turned over, so to speak. He could be doing something like that. But at the moment, it's it's, it's very hard to, to, to try and guess where he's going to go. And as for trainer... I just, I just don't know where he's gonna go, where he's gonna go. But I tell you what, I'm gonna log this. This is gonna be said on record. You can, you can come back to me if I've got this wrong. But I want to say a prediction here. I believe that Carl Frampton goes one of two ways. He's either gonna go with Adam Booth, which, you know, that may or may not happen. I'm not quite sure. Or he goes with David Hay, and and starts being trained by Ishmael Selass. That is my prediction. He goes either to Adam Booth or Ishmael Selass. That is what I'm saying. I've got no inside information. That's just a pure guess. That is what I think is going to happen. Um, I know, I, as you probably agree with that. Um, but yeah, that's all I can really say on that one. So if you've got you know, nothing else to add, then we'll move on to the next. Yep, and yep. finally, boxing legend Miguel Cotter will retire at the end of the year. Yes, obviously he's fighting on Saturday. We're going to get to that in a few moments. But um, it's very interesting. He hasn't said he's retiring after this fight. He's said he's retiring at the end of the year. So maybe he's thinking about having this fight and having one last kind of hurrah maybe in, in, in his native of Puerto Rico. Um, maybe not. Maybe he is just having this fight and he just decided to say at the end of the year. But it's a, it's a strange kind of, you know, kind of time to, to do it. So doesn't look like Liam Smith or, or, or Liam Williams is going to be fighting Cotto, so um, they might be happy about that, to be honest. Depends how he looks on Saturday, but yeah, bit of a strange one, and again, all these people retiring lately, it's just I, I don't know who's going to retire next. It just seems to be one great after the other at the moment. So is that it for the news, yes, Az? Yes, that's it for the news. 
Okay, right, now let's move over to that little segment. We don't usually do this, but I just want to really go through each division and try to give the number one man at that division. Um, I, as I want your opinion on this as well, so I want you to be here to, um, you know, to jump in if you disagree with anything I'm about to say. So let's start at the heaviest weight, of course. Let's start at heavyweight. For me, I, as I think the number one man at heavyweight is Anthony Joshua. Do you, do you agree with me on that? Yes, I do. I think the reason behind that is purely because the number one man was Vladimir Klitschko, then Tyson Fury beat him, and he became the number one man. But he hasn't boxed since, and, you know, I feel sorry for him and all that, but it is what it is. So I kind of reinstated Vladimir Klitschko as the man again, because I've said this analogy before. It's like, you know, it's like... The heavyweight division is like a like a like a school, like a, like an actual you know a, a kids' school, uh, a high school, or whatever. And it's like Klitschko being the main man. He, he's like the bully of that school. And then all of a sudden, Tyson Fury comes from you know another school and he beats up the bully. And for now, he's the main man in that school. But then he moves back to his school and he leaves Klitschko behind. So Klitschko is the bully still, you know, because he's better than all the rest of the guys. That's kind of the way I see it. It's a bit of a funny analogy, but that's the kind of way I saw it. So with Fury out of the picture, I reinstate Vladimir as the legit top guy. Obviously, he's got a little bit older. He took on Anthony Joshua. Anthony Joshua beat him. Regardless of what you say, he beat him. He stopped him. Some adversities in that fight. Some answers in that fight. And, yeah, for me, Joshua stands above Wilder because that's, you know, that's the best win on both of their resumes, obviously. So, for me, Anthony Joshua is the number one man at heavyweight. Um, obviously, we've got Wilder and, and a few other guys in the picture. Joseph Park would have something to say. And, um yeah, that's 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 where I've got him. He's the number one heavyweight. Moving down now to cruiserweight, Ayers, and you may disagree with me here because there's a few guys at cruiserweight. It's kind of like a fresh crop of talent that's come through. Obviously, we've got the likes of, um, you know, Maris Breedis. He's there. He's 32 years old. He's, you know, he's 22 and 0, 18 knockouts. You've got Alexander Rusik. He's 30 years old. Hasn't been a pro for too long. 12 and 0 with 10 knockouts. We're going to definitely see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of answers to these questions, so to speak, when we see this World Boxing Super Series tournament at Cruiserweight. You've got Christoph Glowacki. He's in there as well with a shout. 27 and 1. Um, Alexander Rusik beat him pretty handily, though. You've got Murat Gassiev. He's... Um, 24 and 0 with 17 knockouts. He's 23, so he's the youngest of the batch. Very talented guy as well. Denis Lebedev, really the old one, 30 and 0 with, oh, sorry, not 30 and 0, 30 and 2 with 22 knockouts. I don't think that he's, you know, he's he's at the top. And then you've got Marco Huck, and then of course you've got a man that we're going to be speaking to a little bit later on in the show who's actually also going to be fighting on the Mayweather-McGregor undercard this week. Also, you've got Dmitry Kudryashov, 21-1, and with 21 knockouts, and the one loss was a knockout as well. He's always in exciting fights. Um, it's a who's who of names, really. It's, you know, there's a lot there. There's there's It's hard to kind of pick a guy, but for me, I'd probably say Alexander Rusik probably just nicks it. And it's a bit harsh because, as I say, he's only had 12 fights, but in those 12 fights, he's looked so dominant. Um, he didn't look his best against Michael Hunter, um, but he beat him. He, he, you know, he, he had him down as well in in the in the last round. Obviously, he beat Machunu, had him down um, three times in that fight. Um, the Glowacki win was a really really good win. He he almost shut him out on on one of the cards, and you know. I just think he's he's looked pretty good, as I say, ten knockouts. But um, his last his last fight wasn't a knockout over over Hunter, and also he didn't knock out Glowacki. So you know, when he steps up the level a little bit, maybe he's he's not. I don't know. I don't want to say his power's not there, but maybe he, he can't get the knockout against some of these guys who are a little bit technically sounder than the other guys, if you like. Um, so yeah, but I'd I'd say U6 probably the best at cruiserweight. What's your what's your take on that one, Hayes? Yes, I agree with I I go with Usyk as well because, in my opinion, I reckon he's I reckon he's the best cruiserweight. He's the best cruiserweight out there at the moment. And in my opinion, in the cruiserweight tournament, I reckon he's gonna he's gonna be the favorite to win it. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And also at light heavyweight, let's try to go through this a, a little bit quickly now. I think it's it's really not up for debate. Um, 
I did have Kovalev being the number one man, despite obviously Adonis Stevenson taking the WBC title hostage. He doesn't really fight any top guys. Um, you know, <laughs> it's 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 not very exciting when he fights at all. But um, I mean, obviously this this weekend we're going to see you know Nathan Cleverly and Badu Jack. That's going to be an interesting fight. We're going to get to that shortly. There's a few guys at that weight as well, as I said, like Gavozdik, like Baturbiev, but. For me, Kovalev was the main man. He got beat in the first the first fight with with Andre Ward, and then the second fight was a little bit more clearer that win for Andre Ward. So for me, Andre Ward is undisputedly the top man at that at that weight. Do you agree with that, Ayers? Yes, I agree with that as well. Yeah, moving down to super middle now. Um, again, a few a few good fighters there, a few undefeated fighters. Gilberto Ramirez, he's only 26 years old. He's 35 and 0 with 24 knockouts. Chris Eubank Jr. is there. George Groves is there. James DeGale's there. Callum Smith, the two Darrell brothers. Arthur Abraham, um, you know, a few undefeated guys coming up. You've got Chudanov in there. The man that we spoke to a little bit earlier, David Benavidez, is in there. Um, again, you know, these are all potentially the the top number one guys in the future but for me right now in terms of resume and all the rest of it and the results I think I've got to give it to um to to James DeGale really and truly he could be unbeaten that fight with George Groves his only loss was very close so for me I think James DeGale gets it over Gilberto Ramirez yes I agree with that as well Jerry I think James DeGale uh I'll, I'll choose James DeGale off his uh, performances recent performances that's how I go James DeGale for a super middleweight and down at middleweight now, I've, you know, I've definitely, it's been Golovkin, it's been Golovkin for a long time. Some of the examples I've given over like, you know, up at heavyweight, up at light heavyweight, it's all the story, the, the reason of why I've given it to this guy is because, well, it used to belong to this guy. There is no use to here. Golovkin has been the man at middleweight for a long, long time now, in my opinion, um, you know, you'd have to kind of go back to Sergio Martinez, not in his last couple of fights, but a little while before that, to kind of say that was the man that had a shout. But now Golovkin is simply the main man there. But I will say the winner of him and Canelo next month would determine who is the real king of that division. But as it stands, I've got to give it to Golovkin. Um, I'm not even going to ask you your opinion, I know that you totally agree with me there. Um, moving down to 154 now, super welterweight slash junior middleweight. Um, there's a lot of talent there. I've said it for a long time. You've got Liam Smith. You've got Jarrett Hurd, obviously unbeaten, world champion, 20-0. and You've got Demetrius Andre, the really good fighter, 24-0. and um, You've got Jamel Charlo, the uh, the WBC champion, 29-0. and You've got Lara, though. He's the man that sticks out at the top for me. Hasn't got the prettiest record on paper, but his two losses have been to Canelo and Paul Williams, which was, um, you know, both both fights were very, very controversial. So for me, I think Lara just about grabs the, the number one spot for me at Super Welterweight. You may have a different opinion, Ayers. Would you, you know, what's your what's your opinion on that one? It's between the Ch- Jamel and Charlotte or Islam and Lara. I can't really choose with that one. It's a very tough one. If I have to yeah, go, I may have to go with Lara. Lara. I think Lara's, I think Lara's done good, and he he just lost that in my opinion to Canelo. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he's he's probably got the better names on his resume, so I think we'd have to give it to him. Now, down at welterweight, where there's always been a real, you know, a real mix of talent there. There's so many really good guys at welterweight. Um, Via BoxRec, they actually put Jeff Horn as the number one. I'm not going to be going with that nonsense. He did beat, however, in my opinion, the number one. I would have given the number one spot, if you'd have asked me a few months ago, to Manny Pacquiao, purely because, you know, he hadn't lost for a long time, obviously, since the Floyd, um, you know, the Floyd loss, which you can't really blame him for that. But even still, Floyd, you know, he retired. He's come back, obviously, this week. Um, So, yeah, for me, it was Manny Pacquiao. Despite him aging, we hadn't seen him lose a fight. So, you know, Jeff Horn beating him, and it was a real terrible version of Pacquiao. Jeff Horn doesn't become number one, sorry. Um, I'm going to give it to Keith Thurman. And the reason behind that is simply because he's got the wins over, you know, a quite old and quite shot version of Robert Guerrero. I'll be honest about that. But of course, he fought Sean Porter and Danny Garcia, two guys that are serious guys. And he fought them back to back. Saying that, he only won those fights 
I mean, he won the Danny Garcia fight by a split decision. I think that was a, a bit crazy, one of those cards. But it was still a pretty close fight. And the Sean Porter fight was very much the same. There was only two points in that across all three scorecards. Also, you've got to mention he got a win over Bundu. It wasn't a very impressive performance. I mean, he shut him out and he had him down in the first round. But, um, you know, if you if you look at that win compared to the job that... Um, that Errol Spence did on Bundu. It doesn't look so good. He also got the win, of course, over Luis Calazo. So I think for him, he's he's got the you know he's got the best resume at one four seven. Um, you know, without Manny Pacquiao, obviously, but he's still undefeated. Keith Furman. He's now twenty eight and zero with twenty two knockouts. So for me, he's number one. Some people would disagree. Some people would say Errol Spence is the number one guy, and the reason why I don't give it to him is because his real top top opponent. He's only got one real standout name, and that's Kell Brook. And Kell Brook, I'm not trying to make excuses, but that fight was very close until the later rounds where he crashed the weight, we all know. And also, of course, the injury, and he was coming off a loss. He was coming off of quite a long layoff. It was all stacked against Kell Brook. The only thing he had in his favor was the fact that he was in Sheffield. Um, aside from Kell Brook, his resume, if you look at that, Bundu's on it. Yeah, it was an impressive knockout in round six, but... You know, let's be honest, Bundu is Bundu. He's, you know, 40-odd years old. Um, but no, as I, as I did say, this win looks better than the win that Keith Furman got over Bundu. Aside from him, you've got to look at the likes of Chris Algieri. You know, he knocked him out in five rounds. Okay, but Chris Algieri is quite limited. Also on that resume as well, Chris Van Heerden. He got him out of there as well. But... Um, you know, aside from that, I mean, he's beat some other good guys, don't get me wrong, but just the pure, uh, you know, the pure fact that he beat, uh, Keith Furman beat Danny Garcia and he beat Sean Porter, he's just got the better wins. Those two there. I'm not saying they're as good as Kell Brook, because for me, I would have picked Kell Brook to beat Sean Porter and to beat Danny Garcia. I was calling for the Danny Garcia Kell Brook fight for a long time, but. Keith Furman beat both of those guys, and they're all kind of around the same sort of level. And I'm not quite sure what Kell Brook has left to offer since that Golovkin fight. So for me, Keith Furman just pinches that number one spot. What's your opinion on that one, Ayaz? Do you put Keith Furman at, at, at the top of 147? Yes, I would. I'll put Keith Furman because of his recent performance. Yeah, yeah. And now going down to 140, we're going to, again, try to go through this as quick as we can. I just want to give reason behind all this. And again, if you want to get involved in this, hit us up on Twitter, at Box Hard Podcast. You can have your say. We'll read out as many tweets as we get. Um, at 140, Terence Crawford, We, you know, he's got all four of the belts, so you can't really complain about that. He is the man there. Um, you know... It's, it's, it's undoubted. He is the true man there. Mikey Garcia at the moment is actually rated at 140 because of his recent win over Adrian Broner. That was at 140, of course, but I'm not going to include him in there. Um, but even if he was included, I think you've got to give it to Crawford purely because he is the man at 140. Mikey Garcia has not really had the fights at 140 to kind of stake a claim. Um, there's not there's not really much at 140 to, to really... Um, to even really be in there with a shout. He, uh, Terence Crawford, he's head and shoulders, really. Well, head, shoulders, legs, and, and feet above everybody. He's he's much better than the guys at 140. I know that you're not going to argue with that one. I was going down now to lightweight. Here is where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, some people would definitely say it's Linares. Some people would definitely say it's Mikey Garcia. Some people, especially from Cincinnati, Ohio, would go with Robert Easter Jr. Some people from Manchester might even throw Terry Flanagan in there. Some people from Hull might even throw Luke Campbell in the mix. But for me, it's got to be Mikey Garcia. I think he's better than Jorge Linares. You might disagree, Ayers. How do you see the lightweight division? In my opinion, I'm going to have to go Mike Garcia because of his recent performance. Obviously, you've seen who he's fought. He's beaten Zlatan Cannon. He's fought. The way he beat up Adrian Broner, it was just too much. And I think Mike Garcia, I reckon, is the best fight in that division. Yeah, you'd have to give it to Mike. As I said, I'm not trying to knock Jorge Linares. He's, he's, you know, he's a top talent. But I just think at this point of his career, and I know he, he looked really good against Crawler, but that's against Crawler. It's, um, I was really looking at the Luke Campbell-Linares fight the other day, really thinking about him. Do you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if Luke Campbell causes a lot of problems. And I was, you know, from, from the minute it's been made, I've always been saying it's an easy knockout for Linares. He's going to stop him. And I'm not saying that's not going to happen, but there's a bit of me what kind of thinks that Luke might be a bit too fresh for him. You know, like, I mean, I hope that is the case because I want the Brit to win, of course. But, you know, it's, Linares isn't, 
he's not he's he couldn't beat Mikey Garcia. That's that's my honest opinion. It'd be a great fight though, don't get me wrong, I do want to see that unification. Now moving down to Super Featherweight, there really is one man at it. He's the number one pound for pound boxer in my opinion, I as I think you'd probably put him number one pound for pound in your you know, your top list as well. Um it's definitely gotta be Lomachenko. Do we even need to say any more? No, Lomachenko's too good. Yeah, yeah, definitely Lomachenko. Moving down now to featherweight, um, you know, we we mentioned Carl Frampton a little bit earlier. You've got Gary Russell Jr. there as well. You've got Lee Selby, a few others. Josh Warrington obviously creeping into the, the, the top 10 in, in a few of the bodies. Um, Leo Santa Cruz, though, for me... Iaz probably gets that. I think it was a you know a close fight, but he lost that fight at the first time around against Frampton. He was much better in the second fight. You know, he, it's a shame he hasn't honoured his word and come over to Ireland to have the third fight. But for me, as it stands, I think Leo Santa Cruz is the top man at featherweight. I have to agree with you that he's only got one uh, loss on his record. And they came to Carl Frampton, but in my opinion, I'm going to have to go with Leo Santa Cruz. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. And now moving down to bantamweight, let's try to get, let's try to whiz through this now. Um, coming down to bantam, oh no, sorry, super bantamweight. We're at super bantamweight. You've got to look at, you've got to look at Rigondo. I think he's the man at, uh, at super bantamweight. Um, do you agree with me? As he, he's the main, he's the main man. He hasn't really got some of the top top names. You know, fighting the likes of Jazza Dickens doesn't do your your credibility too much, but. Um, you know, aside from that, he's a he's a really good fighter. I mean, he's fought Jazza Dickens. He's beaten Nonito Donaire. So, in my opinion, yeah. I'm gonna have to go. That's Rigondo. the main. Yeah, that's the main. That's that's the that's the real main name on his resume, Nonito Donaire. Um, moving down now to bantamweight. Um, you've got Jamie McDonnell. You've got Yamanaka. You've got Zalani Tete. This is a very um, you know, a very hard one. This one. Ryan Bennett's also there as well. Obviously. Um, Lee Haskins, a few other guys. Um, you got Zanat Zakhanov as well, who's going to be unifying with Ryan Burnett. For me, I oh, you probably got to give it to Yamanaka. But the bad thing is, he lost his world title last week, and I've heard. I don't want to go on record and say this because I'm not a hundred percent sure it's been confirmed. But I've heard that the guy he lost to, Luis Neri, who's from Mexico, he's 22 years old. He just turned 24 and 0, and he stopped Yamanaka. Um, apparently, he's just failed a drugs test, so I'm not quite sure what the situation is going to be with that. So he may lose the title, and Yamanaka may be reinstated. So you'd probably have to give it to Yamanaka for the meantime, but I think Jamie McDonald definitely deserves a shout. Um, what's your take on that one, Ayers? I'm going to have to probably go with Jamie McDonald because I'll tell you one thing. He won the IBF belt, lost the IBF belt, and won the WBA belt. And since then, he's defended it, um, he's defended it and he's won it successful time. So I'm going to have to go with Jamie McDonald in the bantamweight division. Yeah, I mean, as I said, he's in there with a shout. I think, um, you know, if you're looking at Yaman some people putting him in their pound-for-pound pound list... Listen, it's you know that'd be a great fight. I'd like to see that fight, but f- of course Yamanak has got a few problems at the moment with this whole situation with Lewis Neary and the WBC belt. So um, yeah, we'll leave that there. Moving down to super flyweight now, the one man down here for me is Chocolatito Roman Gonzalez. Even though he lost that fight, and I think he did lose that fight to that man from Thailand with a few names, and some people have got him at the top of the list. They're going to be having a rematch. I think he's going to win that fight. Cal Yafai, of course, also at Super Flyweight, also a world champion there. Uh, John Real Casemiro as well. But for me, I think we're going to give it to Chocolatito Roman Gonzalez. I think you agree with me on that one, Ayaz. Oh, yes, definitely. I have to agree, agree with you on that. I'll tell you one thing. Um, if Chocolatito Roman Gonzalez didn't get the cut on the fight, I reckon he may have would have won the fight. Yeah, I think the cuts, this cut, the cut really seemed to bother him. I think we've said that a few times on this show. And now moving down to flyweight, I think this is going to be the last division that we're going to look at. Um, you know, I'm starting to look at some of these names, and I'm not quite sure who they are. That's the casual in me coming out a little bit, I suppose. Um, Andrew Selby's obviously up there with a shout. We need to see him in a big fight soon, and I've got a feeling it will be coming. You've got. Um, You've got Donny Nietes, who's 40-1 and one with four draws. I'd probably say him, to be completely honest. Um, and also, you've got Kazuto Ioka, who's 22-1. and one. That one loss coming to... And that Ruin Rong, who obviously um, 
you know, he lost to John Real Casemiro. So it's all a bit of a, you know, everybody's kind of fought everybody down at these low weights. And we need to see Andrew Selby in and around this mix with his top few fighters. But for me, I think I'm going to give it probably to Donny Nietes the Filipino native so um, that's it and I don't think we're going to go any further I don't think we're going to go down to light flyweight or anything like that or minimum weight I think we're going to leave that there so that's it we've given our top fighters from heavyweight all the way down to flyweight as promised Let's now kick on with the previewing. Of course, it's going to be, you know, there's a few things to go over. It's, it's arguably going to be the biggest week of boxing in history. So let's waste no time. Let's get on with it. Let's start, though, with a card happening on Friday at the Buffalo Run Casino in Miami, Oklahoma, USA. One fight to mention over here. Um, Torino Johnson, 20-1, and 1, takes on Sergei Derevianchenko, 10-0. and 0. That's a really, really good fight, by the way. That's going to be on Fox Sports 1. Lou DiBella, the promoter of that show. Um, Sergei Derevianchenko, obviously, you know, a uh, decorated amateur. Torino Johnson, obviously, the home fighter. Only one loss on the resume. Good pro as well. Um, can't remember who he lost to now, I slipped my mind, but that should be a really good fight, I just thought we'd give that a mention, the undercard doesn't look all that great though, um, moving over now to the Grand Casino in Hinkley, Minnesota, USA, one fight to mention on this bill, friend of the show now, he was on last week's show, I think, or maybe the week before, can't remember now, Hassim Rackman Jr., his record 2-0 and with two knockouts, both in the first round, by the way, He's in a four-rounder against Danielle Williams, who's also 2-0, and and I didn't know anything about him, but Hassim Rackman told me he's got an MMA background. Um, I think he's got one stoppage out of his two fights, and I think he's been a bit of a, uh, a knockout artist in, in his MMA background. So all the very best to Hassim Rackman Jr. He did say to me on last week's show that he's going to be coming over to the UK to fight very soon, so I'm very excited about that. All the very best to Hassim Rackman Jr. Now moving over to the Rainbow Tower, Conference Center in Zimbabwe. One fight to mention over there, Ilunga Makabu, former opponent of Tony Bellew. His record at the moment, 20-2. and two. He's had one fight since being knocked out by Bellew, but this is his second fight back. It's an eight-rounder. He takes on a man called Musa Ajibu. And, you know, we're probably the only podcast that actually mentions fights like this over in Zimbabwe at the Rainbow Towers Conference Center. Nobody else probably talks about that. The promoter is a man called Steve Kalakoda. Who knew it? He takes on, as I said, Makubu. He takes on Musa Ajibu, who's got a record of 28 and 9 with 5 draws. All love to Makabu. Um, over there in Zimbabwe, and now moving over to the Plaza del Toros in Benidorm, Comunidad Valenciana, Spain. One fight to mention over here, Kiko Martinez. He's back in Spain, he's back fighting a man that we've never heard of. He's back racking up the wins on that ever-padded record, I suppose. The promoter, by the way, is Sergio Martinez, a man that we mentioned earlier with a shout to be the top man at middleweight a few years ago. So he's the home promoter here in Spain. Kiko Martinez, 37-8 and eight with one draw. He takes on Lorenzo Parra, who's got a record of 32-12 and 12 with two draws. It's an eight-rounder there for Kiko Martinez. And now moving over to the big one, I suppose, this weekend at the T-Mobile Arena, Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. We're going to start with the undercard. We're going to mention Savannah Marshall, the Brit, making her debut here. She's, of course, being promoted by Floyd Money Mayweather. She's in a four-rounder. That's four two-minute rounds against Sydney LeBlanc, who's got a record of four wins, three losses, and one draw. So a winning record against Savannah Marshall there, all the very best to her. Also on that bill, Kevin Newman, he gets out against Mark Antonio Hernandez. Kevin Newman 7 and 0 with one draw. Mark Antonio Hernandez, sorry, Mark Anthony Hernandez 9 and 1. Um also on that bill, Andrew Tabiti 14 and 0. 12 of those wins by knockout. He puts his NABF Cruiserweight title on the line against Steve Cunningham. We're going to be speaking to Steve Cunningham very shortly. His record 29-8 and eight with one draw. And of course, he's the former two-time Cruiserweight champion of the world. All the very best to Steve Cunningham. We're going to be speaking to him very shortly. Also on that build, Javante Tank Davis, 18-0, and 0, puts his IBF World Super Featherweight title on the line against Francisco Fonseca. A lot of people have been a bit angry with his choice of opponent. With Fonseca here, 
do you know what? I've looked a little bit, you know, I've looked at some of his fights. He's not as bad as some people are, 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 are kind of saying this fight's not as bad as what some people are suggesting it is. Um, he's a good fighter, man. He's he's not that bad. He's, you know, he's decent. But believe me, I think that Javante Davis is, is certainly the classier fighter, certainly the better fighter, certainly the fresher fighter. And, you know, he's got the he's got the real names on his resume. Francisco Fonseca hasn't really fought at this level, but Nonetheless, somebody's O has got to go, and that's the same for the main event that we're going to be talking about in just a moment. Also on this bill, your Dennis Ugas, 19-3. and three. It was supposed to be Sean Porter, but he had to step in because somebody in Sean Porter's family passed away, so he wasn't ready for the fight, and he steps in against Thomas Delorme, 24-2. and two. That should be okay, I suppose. Also on the bill, the real, you know, the real best kind of fight, in terms of competitiveness on this bill. Nathan Cleverly puts his WBA World Light Heavyweight title on the line against Badu Jack. Nathan Cleverly 30-3, and three. Badu Jack 21-1 and one with two draws. Uh, this is, of course, Badu Jack's first fight up at light heavyweight since relinquishing his super middleweight world title. And, you know, he, he let that title go, he vacated it, and that title's now on the line for David Benavides, who we spoke to earlier in the show. It's all a bit of a mashup this week. Firstly, Iaz, let me talk to you about the Nathan Cleverly Badu Jack fight. As I said, it's the first fight for Badu Jack at this new weight. Cleverly, of course, he's you know he's been out the ring for a little while now, but he looked good in his last fight. You know, he's he's got the punch output. Can he make it uncomfortable for Jack? Can he win in Las Vegas? More importantly, oh, that's a very tough one. I'll tell you one thing. If I'm going to go for a choose a win, I'm going to go for Badu Jack. A, it's in Vegas, yeah? And B, he's going to have the, all the home support with him, right? And obviously, the thing is, now, Cleverly hasn't fought since November. And that's the last time he fought was against um, Jürgen Bremer, which he stopped. And obviously, he because he ain't been out of the rink, he's got a lot of ring rust in him. What if I was Cleverly, I would have had like a little warm-up match and then go into the Jack fight. But if I'm going to go for a win, I'm going to have to go for Jack. Yeah, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I saw a tweet from Eddie Hearn the other day. And I was going through my tweets on Twitter, and it was like all the tweets that I've liked. And Eddie Hearn, I'm sure he first mentioned the Badu Jack Nathan Cleverly fight. I'm sure he mentioned it in March. And they've kind of been hanging out to get this fight. And it was going to happen one minute, then it wasn't so you know, it wasn't looking like it was going to happen. It wasn't really close to being to being to being a, a done deal. And then it kind of got close again. It's been a little bit back and forth. So I don't really blame Cleverly for not having a fight in the meantime, because again, you can't really have warm up fights when you're an active world champion. So, you know, Badu Jack, he last fought in in in, in January of this year, and that was obviously against James DeGale. That was a draw, a majority draw, and that was a tough fight in some stages of that fight. So hopefully that's took a little bit of steam out of him. But um, for me, I think I think if if I had to give a prediction, I think it's Badu Jack on points. I did you say Badu Jack on points as well? Yes, I did. Yeah, so I think I think Badu Jack probably wins that fight on points. Unfortunately, um, but I do want to see I do want to see Nathan Cleverly retain his title here and get the win. Um, but no, you know what? The f- the funny thing about Badu Jack, I was talking to him back in 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 May, and um, I was talking to him and Ashley Fearfain. They were over in the UK, and I put my arm around Badu Jack, and I got to tell you this: it was so weird. I know he wasn't in you know in the gyms training, so to speak. He'd been out the ring for a while, but he just kind of had that body type, like. I don't know, it's so it's so hard to explain. Sometimes you put your arm around a boxer and they're solid. You know, they're absolutely solid. Like, they're, they're, you know, they're really in good shape. And Banu Jack, I'm not saying he wasn't in shape when I saw him. He looked like he was, you know, he didn't look like he put on loads of weight. But he kind of had this, like, kind of, like, soft kind of, like, skin I, I can't it sounds really wrong but like I put my arm around him he just kind of seemed like I don't want to say flabby that's the wrong word but he was really really kind of soft like I don't know he just didn't seem like a solid boxer you wouldn't have put your arm around him going oh he's a, he's a tough guy it just didn't seem like he kind of had this it was really really weird I can't explain it it was just like I don't know he just didn't seem solid so moving up in weight, I don't know. I don't know. We're gonna to have to wait and see. I mean, I don't know if that even holds any kind of, uh, you know, credibility. What I'm saying there, if that even means a single thing. But it was just striking. I put my arm around him. It felt like I was putting my arm around my cousin, you know, like or, or one of my friends or someone like that. It just, he didn't seem like a boxer. He just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's really weird. It's, it's probably to no avail. It's, it probably doesn't mean a single thing. But um, 
thought I'd throw that in there anyway, as we do. We like to throw out weird stuff. Um, that's it for that one. Moving over now to the main event, of course. A man in one corner, Floyd Mayweather Jr. It's actually happening. I has 49-0. and 0. He puts his O on the line against Conor McGregor. He puts his O on the line as well, of course. He's got 0-0 zero and zero as his record. No wins, no losses. He's making his debut here. He's going to make more money in his debut than any boxer has ever made in his debut. And not only that, he's going to make more money in this fight here than most boxers will make in their entire, entire career. Times 10. You know, or even more, probably times a hundred. He's gonna make some serious, serious dosh. Um, I can't really talk too much about this fight because I don't really know much about Conor McGregor. But we've all seen the little footage of, you know, the little sparring footage with Paulie Malignaggi that about fifteen seconds of it or so. And even though I've got to be honest, I really do like Paulie. But even though we saw a fifteen-minute cut-up clip. In that 15, or sorry, not a 15 minute clip, a 15 second clip, and it has all been cut up and edited and put in great angles and all that. Paulie Malinaji took a bit of a beating for that 15 seconds, so that was a little bit, it didn't look good, it really didn't look good. So, um, it is what it is, but Paulie Malinaji again is a retired boxer, so you know, make of that what you will. Um, Conor McGregor's a southpaw. Floyd Mayweather has had problems with southpaws. I suppose we've got to bring that point up. He's sometimes had problems with southpaws. When you think of, um, you know, the likes of Zab Judah and some and, and, and all these other things, and also the rumor going around that Zab Judah apparently knocked Floyd out in sparring the other day. It just sounds like a load of made-up nonsense. But um, oh, eyes! I can't believe I'm even talking about this fight. It is simply a circus. Floyd Mayweather is going to toy with Conor McGregor. I don't even know if I want that to happen. I've got two horses in this race kind of thing. That's what I'm going to say. The reason behind that is I don't really like Floyd. So I'd like to see McGregor beat him. However, the loss for boxing is greater than my dislike for Floyd Mayweather. You know, like, the whole of boxing would take a nosedive. It would kill the sport of boxing. It really would. Some people, by the way, saying that this is bad for boxing, this fight, it's not. This brings boxing a hell of a lot of publicity. There's guys out there. You're either an MMA guy or you're a boxing guy. I'm a boxing guy. Ayers is a boxing guy. Some people listening right now may be MMA guys. And they might be here to hear our point on this on, the, on, this, on this whole crazy fight. Um... And there's a lot of guys that say boxing's better than MMA. There's a lot of guys that say MMA is better than boxing. It really comes down to this. If Conor McGregor was to step foot in that ring and beat Floyd Mayweather, it would be the biggest upset in history. And it would kill boxing because it would make boxers look stupid. So I cannot let that happen to boxing. So for me, I've got to go with Money Mayweather. Also, my head goes with Money Mayweather. You know, he he should win this fight. He should toy with Conor McGregor. And really and truly, he should stop Conor McGregor. That is what I'm going to say about it. Um, Other than that, I can't see it being competitive. But like I say, this is good for the sport of boxing. It brings a lot of attention to the sport of boxing. And a lot of MMA fans will be watching this and they will become boxing fans as soon as the fight's over with. Ayaz, I'm just going to really give it to you. What is your opinion on this whole fight? We all know it's a bit of a circus. Some people say McGregor's going to win. He's even been saying this week that he's going to stop Mayweather with inside one round. It sounds crazy. Do you know what? Listen, this is a joke of a fight. It's weird because it's, a, it's an MMA fighter, right? Conor McGregor fighting a boxer who's, in my opinion, is the boss, best, best boxer in this generation. You're 49 and 0, and you're fighting a guy that's not even had one boxing match in his entire life, and you're fighting Floyd Mayweather, right? A lot of UFC fans, yeah, Ma- McGregor's going to win. It's, McGregor will not win. Hey, I'll tell you where it's going to go, yeah? Some people are saying knockout. The last time Floyd Mayweather knocked out a fighter was Victor Ortiz, and that was in 2011. I'm going to go for Floyd Mayweather points win. I reckon Floyd Mayweather is just going to play about with him the whole fight. Like I said, last time he knocked that guy was Victor Ortiz. And I reckon this fight will go to points. And that's when Floyd Mayweather is going to win. It's going to be a 50th win. And of course, when he gets that 50th win, he will break Rocky Marciano's record. A lot of people, as as you say there, you know, why is he having this fight? Do you know what? I will give him a bit of a pass. Because if he fought Conor McGregor in his second or third pro fight, there would have been no complaints. The only thing he's doing is he's actually having this fight the wrong way around, so to speak. Um, 
you know, if he actually takes in points, it's kind of embarrassing. It is kind of embarrassing. If he cannot knock this guy out, it is embarrassing. And as you say there, last time Floyd got a knockout was against Victor Ortiz, and we all know what happened in that fight. That wasn't even a proper knockout. That was a joke that day. And I think, for me, his his last proper, legit knockout was against Ricky Hatton. That was a long time ago. But here we are with Conor McGregor. I just cannot... I, I can't even say any more words about it. This is an absolute joke of a fight. And all these crazy people, these crazy... You know, combat sports people, these MMA guys, they are making this fight such a huge, huge fight. It's going to be possibly the highest grossing boxing event of all time. It's going to surpass Mayweather Pacquiao. Let's see. Let's see. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. We're going to have to wait and see. But I tell you one thing. One thing is for sure. This is unbelievable. This is crazy. Mayweather Pacquiao, we all know it was a terrible fight, but both men, you know... Again, I think someone else said it. On fight week, some people were split. And we're not talking about guys who don't know boxing. We're talking about proper boxing people. Some people thought that Pacquiao was going to win. I actually thought Pacquiao was going to win. And I'm going to be honest about that. Floyd Mayweather had his people backing him to win. And of course he did win. This fight, no boxing person, unless they're Irish. I've seen, um, what's his name? Um... What's that guy's name, Ayaz? He's, he's fighting in America. Irish guy. Um, we've had him on the show before. He's completely slipped my head. Um, oh, man. Jason Quigley. Jason Quigley. Yeah, that's Jason. it. Jay Quigley. Yeah, he is strongly going with Conor McGregor. It can only be because he's Irish. There's no way... You know, I, I've spoke to Quigley. I've said, I've said, what do you think about Golovkin? And he will give you a really intelligent breakdown. He will tell you what Golovkin does right and wrong. He knows he's boxing. He's a good undefeated fighter, a possible future world champion. There's no way on earth he truly thinks that Conor McGregor is going to win this fight. He's going with him because they're both from Ireland. I don't care what no one says. Nobody in the actual boxing fraternity, unless they are Irish or they know Conor McGregor, is giving him a chance here. But do you know what? If he were to pull it off just because Floyd got old, and it's not so much overnight. Floyd's been out the ring for a long, long time. If he shows his age in this fight and Conor McGregor comes through, it will be shocking. And could you imagine how much money the rematch would make? Oh, boy. But no, for me, I think Mayweather's definitely going to be on his A game. He wants to break that record. But I tell you what, so many people have been so close to doing it, and so many people haven't done it. So that is something there. But that's about it. That's the only chance I give McGregor. If if Floyd is is suddenly really old and and McGregor's you know can jump on him early probably that's it. But I don't even give him a chance. It's like Floyd. It's like uh, the the great Muhammad Ali said. What's the chance? You know, what's the chance on somebody beating me? Two chances, slim and none. That's what I say to Conor McGregor. Um, but like I say, if he won. <laughs> It'd just be the biggest upset ever. But that's it. There's nothing else to say about it. I can't give a tactical breakdown because he's never had a damn fight in boxing. That's it for Las Vegas. Moving over now to the StubHub Center in Carson, California, USA. The final bill to mention of this week. It's it's a shame that both bills are going to be happening at the same time. One's on Sky Sports pay-per-view over here. £20. It's not the $100 um, charge in the United States. And one card's going to be on Box Nation. The Box Nation card, however is the Miguel Cotto card. His record, 40-5. and five. He takes on Yoshishiro Kamagai, 27-3 and three with two draws. I've only seen Kamagai fight once, and it was that really good fight. I think it might have even been fighting a year against Robert Guerrero, but let's be honest, it was an aged Robert Guerrero. But it was a really, really, really good fight. And, you know, Kamagai can certainly dog it out, whereas Miguel Cotto, he's been in a few of those fights now. And... I actually think this fight's going to be somewhat competitive. I can't pick against Cotto, but he's not been active lately, and Kamagai has been. So, for me, I mean, I'm going to go with Miguel Cotto to win, but I don't think it's going to be... You know, I don't think he's going to have it all his own way. That one is also for the vacant WBO World Super Welterweight title. And also on that bill, Ray Vargas, 29-0. We saw him come over here and win 
that fight against Gavin McDonnell, a real heartbreak over here in Doncaster. Ray Vargas looks to move to 30-0. and 0. He takes on a man as well who's actually had 29 fights as well, but his record is 28-1 and 1 in the shape of Ronnie Rios. This one is the defense for Ray Vargas. He defends his WBC World Super Bantamweight title. This fight, by the way, has gone under the radar. Let me just tell you that much. The only loss on... Ronnie Rios's record was to Robinson Castellanos, whose record doesn't look great, but um, you know he beat Yuri Gamboa. You know he went on to beat him, obviously after that fight. So you know that's that's not a bad man to lose to, so to speak. But Ray Vargas looked really good against Gavin McDonnell, um, and you know he could potentially be one of the best at super weight if you get. Rigondo out of the way, he's probably second best, but um, we need to see more of him, so we're going to see more of him here, I'm going to definitely set that one up to tape, I'm going to be watching the Mayweather card primarily though, I've got to be honest, um, but yeah, no, that's that's another really good fight on, on the weekend, so Ray Vargas there against Ronnie Rios, Miguel Cotto against Yoshiro Kamagai, and that is it really, there's a bit of an undercard there, but no one really stands out to me, no one really is going to get a mention. I think we've done enough talking, Ayaz. We've done the reviewing. We brought in guest number one. It was great speaking to David Benavidez. Some fiery words there for Jesse Hart as well. That would be great to see a unification with those guys and a few of our Brits as well in that super middleweight mix. Then we did the news. There was a couple of things to mention. Then we did, of course... The little segment where we went through heavyweight all the way down to flightweight and gave our best fighters, mine and Ayaz, as we agree on quite a few of those things there. Then we've previewed just there all the fights from this weekend. You went with Conor McGregor um, to lose a decision to Floyd. I'm going to go, Ayaz, with Conor McGregor to get stopped by Floyd. That is what I'm going down with. So we're going to check in next week with the reviewing. And um, we're going to see where we are in the prediction league and all the rest of it. And we've, as I said, we've wrapped up the preview and that's it. There's one last thing to do. It's to speak to a man that is going to be part of this huge bill on Saturday night. It's, of course, time to welcome guest number two. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former two-time IBF Cruiserweight Champion of the World, Steve Cunningham. Steve, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me again, man. I really appreciate it. It's always my pleasure, Steve. With you, it truly is. So, Steve, we last spoke in April. It was just a few weeks after your win over Felipe Romero. When we spoke, I know that you were hoping for a big fight next. You've got it here. Firstly, before we talk about the fight itself, how excited are you to be boxing on possibly the biggest boxing event of all time, the Floyd Mayweather (laughs) versus Conor McGregor undercard this weekend? I don't, man. It hasn't really hit me yet, man. It really hasn't. I haven't. I didn't want it to. I don't want it to hit me at all. <laughs> I just want to go in and do my job. But you know, without without those extra added nerves, it ain't the biggest event in the world. I mean, but it is the biggest event, you know, in boxing ever. So it's it's. I mean, it's beyond exciting, man. It's like it's like it could be paralyzing, you know. But uh, even and, and I've headlined shows in Germany, Poland, you know, here in America, but. This is on another level, man. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's basically I got to take that and and turn it into the turn it into fuel, you know, and and get a victory. And of course, you're going to be the away fighter in this fight. You're going to be the away fighter. You're taking on Floyd Mayweather's boxer by the name of Andrew Tabiti. Now, Andrew Tabiti is obviously trained by Floyd Mayweather Senior. He's 14 and 0 with 12 knockouts. He seems to be a pretty good talent, to be completely honest. But this is a huge, huge step up for him. Obviously, um, you know he's the champion in this fight because he's putting his NABF cruiserweight title on the line. But you know, you've been there, you've done it, you've got the t-shirt. This is a huge step up for him. What do you know about him yourself, and how do you rate him as a fighter? Um, you know, I, I've, I've actually commentated his fight against uh, Garrett Wilson, I think a year and a half ago. Uh, you know, he's uh, you know he's a he's a good fighter, got good skill, good decent skill, good uh, you know he got a good trainer in his corner, so that's that's a plus. Um, you know, he's got athletic build. You know, uh, he moves. He jabs. I mean, he's got um, he's got a good um, a good repertoire of um, you know, punches and you know, I can't say nothing negative about him except for you know, inexperience. You know, uh, inexperience. You know, the guys he's been fighting, they're not on the level of what of which he's going to see Saturday. You know, I'm I'm able to do all kind of different things: move, stand there, high guard, hands down. 
take a shot, give a shot, you know. So if 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 a fight breaks out, I'm I'm able to do that. We don't know if he's able to do that, you know. If 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 it's a boxing match, you know, he can box and I can box, you know. So yeah, listen, it's it's gonna be a good show. It's gonna be a good show. Do you feel that the early rounds in this fight are gonna be, um, you know, really interesting? Uh to tell you the truth, I I don't. What I'm thinking, which I'm always prepared for, the either or. But what I do think is, I think he's gonna he's gonna try to initiate the movement and be away and and initiate the jab and all this and that. Uh, you know, just by the just by him emulating Floyd, you know, all the time. So, uh, I believe that. But I mean, if not, if he wants to come in and attack. We can we can go there, you know, and uh, but I think um, I think the early rounds are going to be moderate, you know, not 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 crazy exciting, but not nothing to lull you to sleep, you know, because I'm I'm going to go to work. And last time we spoke, if I'm not mistaken, I know that you know you're you're 41 years of age now. I think I mentioned, you know, like where do you kind of see your future? And if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure you said something like, you know, I'm, I'm ready to, to carry on for a, for a few years yet. I'm, I've got a lot left to offer. Do you feel that this is a must-win fight for you? I don't want to start putting thoughts in your head about, you know, if you were to come up short, but if, if it did, you know, if, if, if things didn't go your way, would you consider hanging the gloves up? Yeah, this, this is a must-win fight for me. Um, I mean... Like like the Amir Mansoor fight was, like the Adamic fight was, but it's it is a little different because I am 41, and you know it's like man, I, I've been there, done that, but I still have energy and juice to continue on with a win. Uh, with a loss, I you know I would contemplate if I'm stopping or not even more. So you know I like I said I have a a, a year a couple years left in my head with the win. But uh, with a loss, yeah, it would make me sit down and say, hey, maybe we can look at, you know, retiring now, you know, if I can't, you know, and and depending on the performance, you know what I mean? So, we'll, you know, we will see, man, how things go, man. I mean, I, I think about that. You know, I know a lot of fighters, like, I'm not thinking about that. And I think that, I think about that. I, t- I try to prepare myself mentally for every scenario, you know, um, just like I do in a fight. Maybe he's going to come out, you know, uh, Bomb, throwing bombs. Maybe he's going to come out boxing. Maybe he's going to use speed. You know, so uh, same thing with with my um, with retiring or not because of the age and and just me being around so long. If I lose this one, I believe, yeah, I might have to contemplate that even harder. You know. Yeah, we certainly hope it doesn't end up like that. Um, the main event, I want to I want to get your thoughts on that. I know it can be a bit of a silly question uh, to some people. I feel a bit silly for asking it, to be honest. But the main attraction <laughs> to this whole card, Mayweather versus Conor McGregor, 49-0 versus 0-0. Zero and zero. How do you see it playing out? Is it is it an easy win for Floyd? Yeah, yes, I believe I believe it is. I believe, uh, I believe like the first round or two, you're going to see Floyd... Um, just you know, just doing things to see what McGregor does, and and then I think I, I think Floyd needs a knockout, you know. Period. He needs to knock him out. Floyd can't outbox this guy and win a decision. That is that will embar- that will be embarrassing to Floyd, I believe, because he's fighting. I mean, he's fighting a guy that's 0 and 0. Yes, he's top UFC MMA guy, but boxing is boxing. MMA is MMA. You know, if Floyd were, or me, or any other fighter was to go into the MMA octagon and fight the top dude, the, the pound for pound, the guy that says he's the greatest of all time, and this guy doesn't get us out of there, that's a blow against that's a blow against them and the UFC. You know, so uh, it's uh, I think Floyd needs to stop this guy, and he needs to do it. I think he's going to do it mid range, but I mean, if he doesn't, it doesn't look good. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you if you thought about, um, you know, if he if he's going to get a knockout or not. I agree with that. I think if he was to win a decision, it's it's slightly embarrassing, not just for Floyd, but the whole sport of boxing. Even I'm going to feel a, t- a tad bit embarrassed to those people. Um, obviously, yeah. <laughs> being in Britain, you know, there's a lot of Irish people here that. Uh, you know, making a lot of noise about McGregor, I'd feel um, pretty embarrassed about that. I want to ask you also about the World Boxing Super Series tournament. It's got all the world champions in at Cruiseweight, apart from Dennis Lebedev. 
What's your thoughts on that tournament? Are you happy it's taking place? It's you know we're going to see someone take all the belts pretty much. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy it's taking place. Um, but I I would have loved to have been part of it. You know, we weren't contacted at all. Then we contact you know Al Heyman, who's my agent. You know he put the fillers out. And it's like, hey, there's not an American, there's no Mar- American market there. You know, there's no American fighters, you know. Um, and here it is, I am at this moment the top cruiserweight in America, you know, uh, two-time former world champion, still giving it a great go. Uh, but there was no, there was no, um, hey, Cunningham, how about being in this tournament? Or or any American cruiserweight, you know, it's a, it's the you got the European cruiserweights, and you got, I think, the Cuban. You got one, two Cubans in there, and it's like, I mean, you know, it's. I, I am disappointed that I, I'm not part of it, but uh, I just gotta, you know, I gotta make, I gotta make bigger opportunities for me. So hopefully, I can win. You know, when I win this fight, I could possibly win, fight the, the the winner of that. That'd be awesome. And. One of the fights that's taking place in that tournament is obviously um, Usyk against Huck. I know, you know, you, you shared the ring with Huck and all that. In my honest opinion, I see Usyk possibly shutting Huck out. I'm not really looking forward to that fight. I think Usyk would probably toy with Huck at this point of his career. I can't see him stopping him. Do you, do you share that opinion with me? You think it's an easy win for Usyk, or do you think Huck can, you know, offer any kind of threat at this point? Yeah, yeah, I think um yeah, a guy like Usyk is uh very talented and very um very skilled and awkward. He's a southpaw and he he fights, you know, he's from the Lomachenko uh camp, so he has those angles <clears throat> and that movement and he's big, you know, big and strong. So, in actuality, I think he possibly could stop Huck, you know, um cuz he he goes for it, you know, but uh you know, again, we'll see. But I, yeah, you, Usyk is a good talent, man. Very good talent. Yeah, absolutely. And also a mega fight happening uh, next month. It's, it's you know, it's the fight that um, everybody's talking about as the real fight of the year, so to speak. Triple G versus Canelo. What's your thoughts on that one? Brilliant fight. Um, yeah, that's a that's a, that's the fight right there. I I I want to see. I'm rooting for you know Canelo. Um, I thought Triple G. I thought it. I thought Triple G lost to uh, Jacobs, but a good fight, a close fight. But I thought Jacobs took it. But it's like you know they're not uh, they're not giving anybody anything close with with Triple G. I mean he's a star, so you know with the star you got to really take it to the star. But I think Canelo can do that. I think he's going to do that. Um, I think we're going to see Triple G in a spot that we haven't seen him before. But he will weather it a bit. But I just think Canelo. His experience with with fighters like Floyd and and and, and others is going to help carry him. And the last couple of questions. Now, the last fight I want to get your opinion on as well: Huey Fury versus Joseph Parker it was supposed to happen earlier in the year. It's now been rescheduled. How do you see that one playing out? Really interesting fight, I feel. It's very interesting, man. Parker is very good. You know, he's um, you know, he's good. He's young. He's strong. He's he's got a what is he like six five? Um. He's pretty. I mean, man, he's he, he's he's hungry. He just got his belt. He wants to defend it as a champion. Hughie Hughie Fury. I know I know personally that they're in shape. Hughie's pretty crafty, um, big too. I I, I can't call that one, man, because you got you've got a guy who just won the title, who just did what everybody wants to do and what he's trained to do, um, for for the longest and what he's attained, you know, what he's tried to attain and accomplish, and he did it, and. Now you have a guy who, who was him a few fights ago, <laughs> you know, and 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 Yugi, and they've been they've been chomping at the bit for a title shot, and I know I know Peter Fury, his father, works them like workhorses, you know, so I know Yugi's going to be in shape. It's, I I can't call that one, man. I'm going to be very entertained, um, you know, watching that one because I believe it's going to be a, a a nice barn burner. We certainly hope so. It's a uh... Very intriguing heavyweight clash, that one, of course. And the final proper question for you now, Steve. You don't have to give it to us if you, if, if you don't have one. Have you got any kind of prediction for your fight Saturday night? How do you see yourself getting that W? Um, yeah, I, I, me personally, I don't really do predictions, man. I, you know, because there are things that happen in the fight that, um, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes you got to, a lot of times you got to just switch up on the fly, um, not knowing the guy to an extent for me personally, but I mean, 
what I can predict is hard work and and me going for the win, period. As I always do, that's what I know. And um, if, 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 I, if I get them hurt, I go for it. Um, if I can't hurt them, I go for it. <laughs> You know, I just I go for I work, man. You know, I I, I want to set things up. I want to outdo them. I want to show them that I'm not this 41 year old, you know, uh, old champion that uh, you know needs to retire. You know, I feel great, man. I do great work in the gym, so you know, I'm I'm in there. I got to show. There's a lot that I want to show, but I I don't and, or or do, and I speak with with my ability in the ring. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, like I say, the uh, the most important thing, obviously, is is getting the W. I'm glad to hear you talking the way you're talking. It's very encouraging for me to hear, and um, I'm excited for it, man. I really am excited for it. Just before we let you go, I don't think I um, I let you do this last time, which uh, I should have done, so I'm going to let you do it this time. Any kind of message you've got for the UK fans, the UK fans over here that could be listening right now? Obviously, you've got a bit of a name over here, mainly for the Fury fight, to be honest, but um, you know, a lot of people respect <laughs> you over here. What's your message to those guys, Steve? Just, uh, you know, uh, man, I'm, I'm the same old Steve Cunningham, just a little more wiser and, and, and uh, pushing. You're going to see the same thing, even a little better, a little smarter. And even if we get into some heat, you know, we, we cook in that type of kitchen very well. So you guys appreciate the support from the UK that I have. Wish I could get over there and have fought one day or, you know, before I, I end up retiring or just even visit to do a meet and greet. That would be awesome. So I will be seeing you guys one day. Hey, oh, yeah, and I, I just met Johnny Nelson. Oh, your hero. Today. Your hero. Yeah, man. He was, man. As a young cruiserweight, man, I was watching him defend his title. You know, um, and he was up there in age also, you know. So I, I told him today, like, man, I've, been, I've watched you a long time, man, and was very impressed and motivated by him. So I got a chance to take a pick with him today, man, and that was awesome. <laughs> Brilliant, man, brilliant. I remember when you was on last time, I asked you who your favorite UK fighter was, and you're the only person who's ever said Johnny Nelson. So, yeah, I'm pleased for you, man. Yeah, man, that was awesome. That was nice. Excellent. Okay, listen, Steve, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. We're going to be behind you this weekend, of course. Best of luck for Saturday, and we're going to catch up sometime afterwards, my friend. All right, man. Thank you again, man. Appreciate it. Okay, and this wraps up episode 97 of the Box Hard Podcast. It's been another American August episode. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I as Sumra has been I as Sumra. A big thank you to our two guests on this week's show, the former two-time Cruiserweight World Champion, Steve Cunningham. We wish him all the very best for his fight on Saturday on the Mayweather versus McGregor undercard. And also a big thank you to our other guest, the future youngest super middleweight world champion in history, David Benavidez, what a fighter he's looking like at the moment. We wish him the best of luck for September the 8th. As always, the biggest thanks of all goes out to our listeners. We'll be back next week with another big show, as always. Until next time, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.